Uh, we are in Mark chapter 5 this morning, Mark 5, and I have been super pumped about this morning uh, because we're starting a new series entitled The Gospel-Centered Life. And what we're going to be talking about is how the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how it speaks into areas that sometimes we don't even realize. And we're going to talk about one of those areas today. And this is an area that sometimes holds us back. It leaves us shackled. It's an area that sometimes causes you to feel like you're not good enough. Or that you can't measure up. Can we just be honest together this morning? How many of you have ever had a time in your life where you felt like you were not good enough or you couldn't measure up, right? Okay, hands up all over the room. The rest of y'all are liars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this causes us sometimes to feel like we're damaged or dirty. This causes us sometimes to be overcritical of ourselves. You ever uh, had some negative self-talk? What am I talking about this morning? I'm talking about shame. Shame. This soul-crushing emotion that literally will destroy, I don't say that word lightly, will destroy your life. Now sometimes we can get guilt and shame confused. Sometimes we can confuse guilt for shame. In fact, there's, there's a, a godly sorrow, a godly guilt that draws you to God. Or, if you've wandered away a little bit, it's, it draws you back to God. But guilt and shame are different. Guilt says, I did something bad. But shame says, I am something bad. There's a difference. Guilt says, I did something I shouldn't have done. Shame says, I am something bad. For example, this individual rejected me, so I'm unlovable. This is just who I am. This company let me go, so I just don't have any value. I am worthless. That's just who I am. That is shame. Now, now here's the funny thing about shame. Shame's nasty, guys. Like, it's just nasty. Shame can come from something that has nothing to do with anything that we did. For example, if um, maybe growing up people have said things to you that have, that have caused you to maybe have a lesser view of yourself than what the scripture says because of what somebody said about you, that can cause shame in your life. If you've struggled or suffered abuse of any type, that can cause shame. If you've had a medical condition, a disability, something that's outside of your control, that can cause shame because it makes you feel like you are less than. Ed Welch, a renowned Christian counselor, describes shame as this. It's the deep sense that you are inherently flawed, unacceptable, and unworthy of love. Because of something you've done, something done to you, or something associated with you. And this, shame, is the human condition. There's not one of us that could sit here with maybe our pride and say, oh, I've never felt this, but we all have felt this. And what we try to do is we try to shake this nagging sense of shame. And sometimes we do it in unhealthy ways. Sometimes what we try to do is we make ourselves busy all the time. Like we're in perpetual motion all the time because we don't want to feel these feelings over here, so we just go, 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 go. Sometimes what we do is we pursue success however we define success. So what we try to do is we think, if I can just be successful, however you want to define it, then I will get rid of this sense of shame. Sometimes we can tear down other people. In fact, if you go on Twitter right now, don't go on Twitter right now. 
If you go on Twitter right now, this is what you'll see. You'll see people bad mouth each other and going at people. But some people, they have their entire like blog internet life is nothing but tearing down other people. You know what they're trying to do oftentimes? They're trying to get rid of the shame that they feel, this inadequacy about themselves. And the way they do it is by putting other people down. Shame is real, guys. And this is why we're talking about this today. Some of y'all, you hear this and you're like a little bit uncomfortable because you're feeling some of these feelings. You're like, man, this is the NFC Championship today and the 49ers are playing. I thought this was going to be a little more joyful message, you know? It's going to be joyful in a few hours. When the Niners win today, can somebody say amen? Yeah. But the gospel, sorry, just got a little... We'll sidetrack there. <laughs> but the good news is that the gospel speaks into our shame and can free us from shame. Yeah. And we're going to see in Mark chapter 5 a woman that spent years dealing with shame. But Jesus freed her. And the same way Jesus freed her from her shame is the same way that Jesus can free you of your shame. Because the gospel speaks in to our shame, and it gives freedom from that shame. And that's what you got to see today. Because today in part one of the gospel-centered life, today you can walk out of here, freedom from the shame that shackled you. So Mark chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 34 or 24. If you are ready for God's word, would you say amen? amen. Mark 5, 24. It says this, it says, so Jesus went with him, this is a guy named Jairus, and a large crowd was following and pressing against him. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. This woman had a, had a constant bleeding for 12 years and I really imagine the, the physical pain that went along with that. But there was also some significant cultural implications that went along with that as well. Because this woman was defined as unclean. She was defined as unclean. Everybody say unclean. Ready? Unclean. Because she was unclean, she had to live in isolation from everybody. Because if she touched anybody that was clean, they would be unclean. So now this woman had to be isolated from everybody. She couldn't be around her friends. She couldn't be around her family. For 12 years, she never got a hug. For 12 years, she never got a handshake. For 12 years, she never even got a fist bump. <laughs> Nothing for 12 years. Imagine the mental and emotional pain that went along with being isolated from everybody for 12 years. And you know what she did because of this? She did the exact same thing that you would do. She went and spent all of her money on doctors. That's what she did. She spent everything she had. She tried to get help. If it was us, you know what we'd be doing? We'd be all over our Google, like trying to find this random doctor over here. Can anybody heal me? Like, I'll, go, I'll go to Mexico and try something. Like, I, I want to get healed. But not only did she not get better, but what does the last line of the verse say? She got, worse. she got worse. This condition, being unclean, defined her every second of every day. She was damaged in the view of judgmental people. She was unwanted. She was less than. She was outcasted. There was no getting away from it. Her Life was filled with shame. This is who she was. So she just decided to do something that was uh, that's pretty drastic. In fact, she decided to do something that, that was risky. In verse 27, it says that she heard about Jesus. Now, isn't it really cool that somebody made Jesus known to her? <laughs> she heard about him. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. Now, for an unclean person to go in a crowd of people was a big no-no. 
because she was unclean and she could infect all the other people. And she could get publicly humiliated and scorned and her entire family could as well. She had no business being around anybody at all. But she's desperate. She's risking public scorn. She's felt this shame her entire life. And she just is hoping that Jesus can do something about this. She feels broken. So she fights her way to him and she, she touches his clothes. Why? Because verse 28, this is what she said. If I just touch his clothes, if I just touch his clothes, then I'll be made well. She has this faith. She has this dependence that if Jesus is who he says he is, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be made well. I will be made whole. And there's something powerful about a person that has faith in Jesus and is dependent on Jesus no matter what the circumstances are around them. We're, we're finishing up, uh, we just finished up yesterday as a church family, our 21 days of prayer. It's just been a great journey for us as we've been um, talking about prayer and these things. But guys, this 21 days, just because we ended 21 days of prayer, let's not stop the wave of prayer that's happening in our church. Like, let's keep being a dependent group of people because God works through a dependent group of people. This Thursday night is our worship and prayer night. And our last worship and prayer night, upstairs in the room, the room was filled up with people, just dependent, praying to God. And guys, can I just say, that is this Thursday at 7 o'clock, and let's just keep it going, <laughs> right? Let, yeah, that's right. We can clap for that. Let's just be people. That will be prayerful, dependent people. It'll be about an hour or so upstairs in the youth room because God responds to people that are dependent and have faith because this woman's faith was met with a response in verse 28, or the next verse, verse um, 29. She had faith in him, and instantly her flow of blood ceased. And she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately she was healed. Immediately she could be reunited with her family. Immediately the issue that had plagued her for 12 years was gone. In verse 30, Jesus at once realized in himself that power had gone from him. He turned around to the crowds and said, who, who touched my clothes? You think Jesus didn't know who touched him? Of course Jesus knew who touched him. It was Jesus. <laughs> He's given this woman an opportunity to go public with her faith. The disciples, the next verse, verse 31, this is how they responded. They told him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? Translation, everybody's all over you, Jesus, there's a massive crowd. But he was looking around to see who had done this thing. And the woman Man, what she, what she does here is just, oh, man, this is powerful. With fear and trembling. Oh, man. Knowing what had happened to her. Came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This woman, if she puts herself out there, this could be the end for her. For an unclean person to put themselves out there is risking public humiliation, scorn. She is now revealing herself to Jesus. And what Jesus can do is Jesus could look at her and say, what are you doing here? You're unclean. He could have rebuked her. He could have said, I, I can't. Don't you know there's a crowd of people? Well, what are you thinking doing, doing this here? He could have done that. And it's interesting, she says, and told him the whole truth. So, Jesus, so this woman who had this issue of blood tells Jesus the truth. She makes herself vulnerable. She says, this is who I am. And Jesus responds in one of the most powerful ways that you could ever imagine. 
He doesn't respond with go away. He doesn't respond with unclean. He doesn't respond with unlovable. He doesn't respond with un- unloved. He responds with the word. What's that word? He responds. He calls her da. This is communicating acceptance, love, identity. He looks at her with compassion. He looks at her in the middle of a world that she has lived in, that has made her feel like an outcast, that has caused her feel like she is less than, that's made her feel like she has no worth. He says, listen, you are now in my family. She's no longer defined by her shame. She's no longer defined by her past, by her sickness, by society. This is not who she is anymore. She's daughter because she came to Jesus by faith. Now, you might be in the room, and you are not yet a Jesus follower. Maybe you have some religion. Maybe, uh, maybe you're, you're spiritual. But to be a Jesus follower means this, that you realize that you're a sinner. You realize that Jesus came and died on the cross for you and gave his life for your sin. He was buried and he resurrected the third day, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what he did for you, and you make the decision to follow him. When we make that decision, just like this woman came to him by faith, and Jesus called her daughter, when we make that decision, we become a part of God's family. This means that we have a new identity. In fact, this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is important. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. So now, this is who you are. Now, this is who you are. Now, here's why this is important, number one. Because the way God views you, is often different than the way than your view of you. So when this woman came to Jesus, she came with baggage. She came with issues. She came with all these other things. She came to Jesus by faith and he says, no, 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 no. Your daughter. This is now who you are. You're not unlovable. You're not insignificant. That is not who you are. And friend, in the room, online, can I say that you are not unlovable and you are not insignificant and you are not less than either. That is not who you are. And what can happen sometimes in our life is we can look at all these other things to define us when Jesus says that's not who you are. I'm reading this book uh, by uh, Neil Anderson. It's a book called Bondage Breakers. It's about spiritual warfare. And uh, the subtitle is, uh, let me read it. Uh, It's Overcoming Negative Thoughts. Anybody ever had a negative thought in here? Yep. Uh, It says, Overcoming Negative Thoughts, Irrational Feelings, and Habitual Sins. Ever struggled with an irrational feeling before? Like, where in the world did this feeling come from? And for all the real honest people in the room, have you ever struggled with a habitual sin in the room? Yes, my hand goes up as well. And in this book where he talks about, it's a book about spiritual warfare, he talks about how do we overcome these struggles of negative thinking, of irrational feelings, of habitual sins. And he says the foundation is viewing yourself like God views you. He says the foundation is understanding who God declares you to be. This is the foundation of everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a little section from Neil Anderson's book, Bondage Breakers, phenomenal book. Can't speak highly enough of it. And let's look at who you are if you are a follower of Jesus. You are accepted. You're God's child. You've been adopted. You are a member of Christ's body. You are a friend of Jesus. You are accepted. This is who you are. Let's keep going. You are secure. You have no condemnation. You are a conqueror in Christ. You are a citizen of heaven. All things are working together for your good. 
Nothing can change those things. This is who you are. You are significant. You are the salt of the earth. You are chosen by God. You are God's temple. You are God's masterpiece. This is who you are. This is how God views you. And get this, family. Freedom from shame happens. Freedom from shame happens when you view yourself like God views you. Amen. I want us to get this. Freedom from shame, I would even say, can only happen when you view yourself like God views you. Some of us right now, we don't realize this, but we're in the midst of spiritual warfare. We're being held captive by certain things, and they just wrap their arms around us. For some of us in the room, we think that we're something. We're like, this is who I am, and God says, no, 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 because of the gospel, because of the cross, that's not who you are. Like, literally, that is not who you are. We're like, no, this is who I am. Christ says, no, 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 that's not who you are. Some of us, some of us think that we're not something, and God says, this is who you are. <laughs> Some of us are like, I can never do this. I can never get freedom. I can never, uh, because of, no, no, that is not who you are. And what we think sometimes is we think, okay, I got to get over, I got to um, overcome this thinking. I got to overcome this feeling. And maybe if I can just, oh, what can I do? I'm just going to get a nicer car. If I get a nicer car, I'm going to feel a certain way about myself. And it's going to shake this sense of shame. Or uh, someone will do, mm, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to a, uh, a self-help seminar, I'm gonna maybe get a little Tony Robbins action going on, pump me up a little bit, and then I'm gonna feel better about myself. But here's what we don't realize, is that this sense of shame is a spiritual problem, because it has to, because we get freedom from it by understanding who God says we are. And spiritual problems require spiritual solutions, and your problems are often way more spiritual than you think they are. Spiritual problems require spiritual solutions, and your problems are often way more spiritual than you think they are. We may think, man, if I could just lose weight, if I could just do this, if I just get this person in order, if they can get back. No, no, listen. We have to say, okay, God, this is who you say that I am. This is a spiritual reality. And when, when things creep up from our past, from what somebody said about us, from an experience that we had, from a feeling that we have within us, when it exalts itself over the truth of who we are in Christ, we need to take that thought into captivity, and we need to say, no, 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 I am who God says that I am. I'm going to view myself like God views me, even if I don't feel like it. I'm going to make the choice. You realize that in the gospel, there are gospel realities. In other words, realities in your life because of what Jesus has done for you. In fact, I would define a gospel reality as this way. It's a, it's a declaration that God's made about us and a reality in our life because of what Jesus has done for us. And when we understand who we are, it's going to change everything about us because your actions and your attitude, and your responses, and your reactions flow out of who you say that you are. If you say, I'm just an angry person, this is who I am, guess what's going to happen? You're just going to have anger flow out, because you view yourself as an angry person. If you view yourself as a victim, you're going to see the world through the lens of, I'm a victim, oh, that person's out to get me, that person's out to get me, because this is how I view myself. But when you realize that you are who God says that you are, that you are a conqueror in Christ, that you're loved by God, that through Christ you can do all things, that he's working all things together for your good and his glory, and you live from that reality, what will happen is your values, your actions, your responses, your reactions will flow from that. But we have to understand that sometimes we don't view ourselves like God views us, and we got to realize, God, this is how you view me, so I'm choosing to view me how you view me. Amen. Amen. Here's my question, guys. How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself 
by what you see in the mirror? Do you view yourself but by that medical condition? Do you view yourself by that situation, by that relationship, by what that person did? Or do you see you like God sees you? Freedom from shame will only happen when you see you as God sees you. But there's an irony in all of this. Here's the irony in this. Is that you can only embrace God's view of you when you make it not about you. Amen. Hmm. And some of us were thinking, man, I, I accepted love. I, I love all this. Like, this is great. Yeah, yeah. But, but you can only embrace God's view of you when you make this thing not about you. In Mark chapter 5, do you remember what, uh, what the woman did? When she came to Jesus, she kneeled and surrendered to him. She didn't say, Jesus, I'm going to kind of surrender to you, but I'm going to hold on to this thing over here. Jesus, I'm going to kind of surrender to you as long as you tell me what I want to hear and do what, you, do what I want you to do. But I, no, that's what she did. She came to him in full surrender and said, Jesus, here's my issue. Here's my identity. Here's my baggage. Here is everything. This is no longer about me. This is about you. Tell me who I am. And we will never be able to embrace God's identity of us until we come to an end of us. We will never, never be able to embrace, you will never be able to embrace God's identity of you until you come to the end of yourself. That's what's so ironic. It's only when you surrender to God that you find the victory over the shame that you need. It's only when you lose yourself in Christ that you can actually find yourself in Christ. It's only when you stop trying to be somebody that you discover that because of Christ, you already are somebody. And the woman wasn't healed from her shame until she took her eyes off of her and placed them onto Jesus. Guys, this is not easy. This is hard. It is hard to, especially in the, spiritual, the spirituality climate that wants to make everything about us. But guys, we have to kick our eyes off of us and put them on to him. Because as Craig Rochelle says, the only way to heal from shame is to move your focus from what you are not to who Christ is. So we're at the end of this sermon this, t uh, this morning. Some of you are like, good, 49ers game is happening. <laughs> but we're going to get honest right now. And we're going to get real right now. We're going to bring this home right now. Some of us right now, there's been some things that have been creeping up as the message has been happening. And some of these things we've talked about, you can like, yeah, you're like, yeah, I know. Yep, yep, yeah. So on the screen and on the bottom of your notes, there's a little saying, a little quote. It's kind of small, but you guys get the idea. It's I am not blank because of Christ I am now I want you to be vulnerable with yourself, maybe for the first time in a really long time. Sometimes the hardest person to be real with is us, right? And what I want you to do, I don't want you to examine your heart and your life. And I want you to write down, I am not, because of Christ, I am. Let me give you some suggestions. I am not bad. Because of Christ, I'm forgiven. I'm not broken. Because of Christ, I'm healed. I am not what other people say that I am. I am not what I did. I am not what someone did to me. I am not what others think of me. I am forgiven. I am changed. I am redeemed. I am healed. I am blessed. I am chosen. I am complete. And because of this, we no longer have to live in shame. 
And the only way, the only way that we, that we are going to experience freedom from shame is if we do what this woman did in Mark chapter number five, is if we go to the feet of Jesus and we kneel in surrender, say, this isn't about me. Who am I? I know I felt like I'm less than. I know everybody's called me unclean. I know that I felt unlovable. I know all this shame that I have. But Jesus, tell me who I am. So what he's going to say. You're my child. And this morning, would you let Jesus tell you who you are? And would you kneel to him and let him give you the identity that your heart longs for? Because that is the only way we can experience freedom from shame. And when we let him define us, we can begin to understand what it means to have a gospel-centered life. And next week, we'll learn a little bit more about this. Let's pray together.